Hey, this is Brent Johnson. You're listening to No Sleep Till Sunday, the show where we talk about the music that makes your skin vibrate. And today, rock and roll troubadour and birthday boy, Mr. Stephen <laughs> Stanley, is here, ladies and gentlemen. Stephen, how you doing, man? Brent, good to talk to you. How are you? Good to talk to you. I am doing very well. I'm doing great. It's like uh, it's the morning after a live stream, which has like really become very similar to the experience of the morning after the show. I, I I'm moving slowly. <laughs> the morning after our live stream. Well, it was it was a great show last night. I watched it, and uh, it was good to see Chris Bennett back in the fold. Uh, yeah, that's the first time I've played with Chris since we were up north. We did a th- we did three shows in in uh, Muskoka uh, very early in March, and then we got home from that, and everybody went into total lockdown. So I haven't played with him, and also you know for his own perspective, he hadn't played any live music um, since then as well, and that's a guy that sort of lives and thrives off playing live. So I think mm-hmm. he was having the time of his life last night and it was great to hear him play. And he brought a, a beautiful like 1950s Gibson acoustic that just sounded so nice. And yeah, anyway, so it was a really, really fun experience. And, uh, you know, the weather cooperated. We were in, we were in my backyard, which has had a nice sort of vibe of its own. And, uh, and uh, the only thing really that that was weird is like for the first couple songs, it was there was a nice breeze blowing, and that breeze just stopped, and it was hot, <laughs> like, like super hot, like just. So yeah, I think I, you know, it's like the old days when um, when uh, Jermaine Jackson would walk off stage with the Jackson Five, saying he'd lost thirty thirty pounds a show. Like uh, like I I can relate right now. I feel like I was completely dehydrated by the whole thing, but fun nonetheless. Worth the dehydration. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It, uh, it was super hot yesterday. I was watching yeah. you guys thinking like, I don't know how you do it. I, I thought you might have had fans set up. Maybe the fans are online only. <laughs> See what a lot of people don't know about you is that you have a comedic talent, your witticisms. I've often joked that you <laughs> actually should open up for yourself with a comedy routine. Do 20 minutes of new material a night. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, most of my most of my friends just label it as dad jokes, and they kind of write me <laughs> off as as a sort of stuff. I did. I did. Uh, there's a there's a, a collection of uh, puns that that some society puts together every year, and it's basically plays on words, and it comes out about this time every year. And I, I just saw the last one, and uh, it was great. And my my favorite was uh, there's a guy who uh, who's addicted to drinking brake fluid but he claims he can stop anytime uh, <laughs> i didn't make that one up <laughs> that sounds like one of yours i was gonna say yeah well you know i, I will use it <laughs> at the appropriate moment you just did all in the arsenal. <laughs> oh, well i look forward to seeing the comedy routine one day we're gonna do that I honestly like I find that to be the most uh, daunting uh, proposal possible. I like, can't imagine being on stage with a guitar. It just doesn't make sense to me. I think those. I, I think uh, my my uh, opinion of stand-ups puts them far ahead of musicians because like I think that's just sort of you're so laid bare and you have only only your words to to make a crowd move with you. And uh, I think that's a really really that's a really hard thing. Oh yeah. So don't don't expect don't expect it anytime soon. Is what I'm saying. No, no. Uh, you know, seriously, that is a difficult gig. I mean, you know, musicians have the music and their guitars maybe to hide behind, but like, you know, even the lead singer, you're you're front and center, you're out there, and if you're not thick-skinned, look out, man. Oh, absolutely. Like The nice thing about playing music is, that, believe me, I, as witnessed last night, um, I do love the, the talking between songs, but the minute you feel it's going south, you can start strumming a guitar. <laughs> you can't do that when you're doing stand-up comedy, unless right. you're a musical comedian. Which maybe that's maybe that's what I should do. Uh, Steve Martin, musical. Uh, yeah, bring a banjo up there with you. Yeah, it could be Canada's next Sean Cullen. Uh, but you know, there's no. I mean, watching watching a guy like that do what he does makes me realize that it's like just I'm not even in the same league. Like it's just the sharpness of guys like that is just beyond. Some of, one of the funniest nights I've ever had was a benefit um, I did that Sean Cullen was the host of, and I think it, like he split my sides open for about an hour and a half that night. It's just amazing watching somebody riff and you know work their craft from a uh, completely improvisational point of view. It's amazing, oh, yeah. off the cuff. Yeah, that's yeah. an art. Well, speaking of live, my friend, you have a new live record. It is out. 
tomorrow, July 10th. And it's tomorrow. Called, it's called Live Static Roots. It was recorded at the Static Roots Festival in Oberhausen, Germany. And you must be super excited about this. I am really excited because, you know, I mean, first of all, this was two years ago we recorded this. We were um, It was the first show of a three-week tour in Europe. We did with a fairly unique version of the band um, on top of it, which was part of why I moved ahead with this. I thought I would just put it up on, on our website and so people could hear it. And then after the, when the pandemic came along, it gave me a little more time to, to think about it and listen a couple more times. And so I had the tracks mastered. And uh, it's just a really, to me, a really nice documentation of a show that I absolutely loved and a show that really doesn't happen for us in North America because the band is a different band, a little more, more of a rock band here, I guess you could say. But we had, um, we had Chris Brown, who produced Jimmy and the Moon, was playing keyboards and also handled the bass duty duties on that sh- on that show. Um, we had a drummer from Northern Ireland uh, named Michael Momeka, who was incredible, and that was the first time he'd ever played the songs. And it was Chris and I, um, a singer named Hallie McCall Thaxton, who does uh, who sings on Jimmy and the Moon and does some amazing stuff on the live record. And then the the sort of the uh, secret weapon was a uh, an accordion player from Kilkenny, Ireland, named Jerry Maloney. And the promoter uh, wrote me about two months before the festival and asked me what I thought about him him flying Jer to the show to play with us. And I was like, whoa, that's, wow. that sounds amazing. At that point, I'd never met him. And he played accordion on the record on, uh, on the Troubadour song. And it's absolutely beautiful. But uh, I wasn't at that session because it had taken place in Ireland and it was a, re- a remote thing. So mm-hmm. he flies Jer over and... At first thinking he was going to only play a couple songs, but in the afternoon we had a chance to sort of sit in the hotel room and rehearse, and it was quite apparent that he not only knew all the songs, but had some real, some real sort of guts to offer to them. So he came up after the first song and played the whole set, and to me that's that's why this record is important to come out, just because it's such a beautiful and nice versions of nice versions of the song and mm-hmm. and uh, songs, and people haven't heard them that way before. So so yeah, I'm excited about it. I'm super excited to hear it. I heard one tune. I want to hear the rest of it. Yeah, that's right. The, the, we did a, a rush. Well, so we, we rushed it out in general because the, the thing is, the festival date this year would have been July 10th. It would have started um, would have started tomorrow. And obviously, obviously, there's no live music this year at all. So uh, Dietmar, who runs the festival, asked me if it was possible we put it out on the day of the festival starting. So. I thought, well, there's a way to do it. Let's do this. So all the streaming services were able to do it. And uh, yeah, we got the artwork together and got the mastering done and it's ready to go. So awesome. tomorrow's That's the great. day. Well, tomorrow's the day and uh, today is the 9th, but um, it'll be the 13th when this podcast airs. So it will be out and available to all. Oh, so, great. Yeah. Check it out, everybody. It's going to be great. And in keeping with your live theme, sir... You have brought in uh, some live songs for your Skin Vibration playlist. Now, I, I like that in the email that you sent me, you called them Skin Vibrators. That's a, that's <laughs> skin a, Vibrators, a, yeah. That's a good name for a band. <laughs> Stephen Stanley and the, and the Skin Vibrators. I can never name my own bands, but I can name other bands. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got, you've got seven songs. You've, you've flouted my guidelines for the show here by bringing in seven, not five, but it's your birthday, Stephen, so I'm going to let that slide today yeah well we'll just we just have to sort of move faster through them i guess but but just as i as i got into making this list this is sort of a very complete look at my favorite live music over you know the entire course of my life so Mm -hmm. i didn't want to really leave anything out and every every song has a very particular uh connection to something in either in the past or the near past so that was important Oh, no, you know, looking at this list, there cannot be a rush on this because this is great. And I identify with a couple of these, too, from my childhood. So we really got to take our time and get through these. I'm, I'm kidding around. This is a, this is a <laughs> solid list. So let's kick it off. So your first one here is Barbara Streisand from 72, and this is Stony End. Yeah. Here's the thing. When, when, you, when you first asked me uh, to you know, put the, a list of songs together, and we decided we were going to sort of concentrate on live to match up nicely with the fact that we're putting on a live record. I hadn't thought about, about the first two songs at all, and so Streisand being one of the first two songs. And I don't know that I'd consider myself a Barbara Streisand fan, but here's the thing. Growing up, my dad was a huge vinyl guy, and 
he would come home from work every day and the six stacker record player would get stacked up and <sighs> we'd listen to vinyl and the TV never really went on till later in the night, so all through dinner and after dinner, it was always music only. Wow. And, you know, he had, he had a very, very definitive style of music that he listened to with that became the music we all listened to. It was, you know, a lot of Johnny Mathis, Perry Como and uh, Frank Sinatra. So, like, you know, it, was, it wasn't stuff that as a kid I was going, boy, give me more of that. <laughs> I think the, the furthest flung it went was into sort of areas like, you know, folk like Gordon Lightfoot and uh, people like that. So there was always music on. And and it just, it just when, when I started thinking about live music, I realized, boy, he listened to a lot. He had a lot of live albums. He listened to a lot of live albums. And this song, Stony End, sort of towards the end of this uh, recording that Streisand did at the LA Forum in 1972. And I think what I liked about it the most was, was the stage banter prior to the song. It comes at the end of the song, My Man, and she gives the audience the choice of two songs. And it's either she's going to play um, Secondhand Rose or Stony End. And she has this really sort of wonderful like banter back and forth with the audience while she helps them decide which song to play. It's funny, you know, like all these years later, like the uh, idea of conversation between songs is so important to what I do now. And it got me thinking, boy, like I, I had a really good example. My father was giving me all those years ago of how, how that how that goes, how yeah. somebody uh, somebody works a crowd and, uh, and and makes it feel completely natural because it does. It feels like listening to the, her int- intro of that song feels completely natural. And Stony End is a great song, but but honestly, it was more the banter that I remember as a kid. Every time it would come on, being very sort of you know micro focused on what she was saying in that in that little introduction to the song. So I thought mm-hmm. that was a cool choice and not an easy feat considering this was recorded at the Forum. It wasn't like she was talking to three people. Yeah. No, exactly. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big crowd. I I love a live record when you hear, and there's a there's a couple good examples of that as we move through this list. But when you hear the audience is experiencing something, something that they know is special, mm-hmm. that is not just you know, it's not just a bunch of people playing music. They're they're reacting to something in a way that you know. And as a musician, when you hit those moments when you're really connected with a crowd, that just feels amazing. I think, you know, I've always, I've always lamented the fact that um, with my old band, Lois and Low, we were playing 250 shows a year at one point mm-hmm. at the, in the heyday of the, of the band when I was, when I was in it. And um, most of our shows went by the wayside. We didn't record hardly anything. And I think the few things we did record, I think there's some okay live recordings, but I don't think we ever sort of had the stars line up where the best shows were captured, uh, you know, on tape or, on, yeah. or recorded. So, you know, I mean, like, too bad. Like, like CBC um, sent a recording unit to record our Massey Hall show, uh, which was our 20th anniversary show. And, you know, it was a great night and something went wrong in the truck and everything got lost. Oh. So, you know, just stuff like that. Yeah. So they had like, we ended up with uh, seven mono versions of songs and they were, and they were unmixed and they were really, there was nothing exciting about them. But, you know, being there that night, there was a palpable connection between the audience and, and the band and it was, it was very exciting. So it would have been nice to have that recording, but it didn't listen to be so. So, you know, that was another reason with me and this, this live record is like, well, so we actually, unbeknownst to me, I didn't know it was being recorded, but we captured the show that it was incredibly special to me. So yeah, let's put it out. Mm-hmm, definitely. Yeah. Harry Belafonte is next with Carnival Medley. Now, did your parents listen to a lot of Calypso music when you were a kid too? They did. They Well, I mean, a lot of, a lot of Harry Belafonte played in our house. Like that was, he was a real, my, my, I was talking to my dad getting ready for this and he reminded me that my mom and dad probably saw Harry Belafonte like live 10 times. So that, I mean, that kind of blows me away. Cause I, I never sort of thought of my parents as live music buffs. Like they would, they would go to see, uh, you know, like uh, Neil Diamond and things like that. But um, Belafonte was a huge thing with my dad and played at our house all the time. And the cool thing about this record is it was, it was recorded at what was then called the Aki Center. Yeah. And now is called the Sony Center. Or is it the Hummingbird? I forget it what it's It used to be the Hummingbird. I think it's something. Uh, is it the Sony Center for the Performing Arts, maybe? Yeah, I think that's what it is. Who can keep up with these name changes? Um, it's a good thing people don't change their names that many times. So yeah, my my mom and dad were actually at the show. So I think that's really cool that the live record that was playing in our house all the time. My parents had been at it. Like that's I didn't. Awesome. I don't know if I was aware of that back then. Again, it's like 
it's a performer at the height of his live career. Like he is so great and so at ease with the audience and just has like banter going back and forth through the whole record that is unbelievable. Like, and like you know, I imagine he must have walked away from that going, okay, we just recorded the greatest show I've ever done. <laughs> I'm not speaking for Harry Belafonte, but it was just fantastic. And um, band before Lowest of the Low was a band called Popular Front. And we, we used to do this song as an encore carnival. Like it was like, you know, a little more rocked up version, but it was it was pretty cool. I mean, That's cool. Closing closing shows with this song was a was a thing we did for probably a couple of years. So, uh, Popular Front wasn't getting the big audiences. It wasn't until Lowest to Low that we got the big audiences, but it was a pretty uh, pretty cool memory. Still, that is cool. I like that. Uh, speaking of rocked up, Rush is next. The Working <laughs> Man. The intro. Hearing neil peart hit that hi-hat like it's it's all it's raw but it's super clear and it just like this is such a great testament to live recordings for me i i 100 percent agree with you and listening to it again that's exactly what struck me it was like how much music those three guys created like how great they were together yeah. when they just played and that that's why i chose this first first of all we're i think working man's one of their one of their greatest like from the early days for sure mm -hmm. and then moving in as it sort of uh you know winds its way into finding my way it's like a great sort of long long song which i like that a lot like it just but that you can feel the uh, energy of you know, of the audience and you yeah. feel that they're they're sort of playing to that energy and it's a great recording too it's like just a great great version and they were just not were they were they're just such good good players that it really comes across as unbelievable and you know 1976 at massey hall and then um about three four years later i was hired as an usher at massey hall and worked there for five years no as an usher and I so I, obviously i wasn't at this show i was a bit bit too young but afterwards saw hundreds of shows at massey hall and you know really kind of formed my vision of what live music was because because that hall is so special, like there's so many bands that come in there and you know, put on the performance of their lives because it's just so conducive to to a great live experience. Oh, absolutely! So, yeah, that yeah. must have been a great gig for you, Usher at Massey Hall. Yeah, it was. You know, it's funny because like we, it was a they had a, a special deal with the government. We were paid seven dollars cash a night. <laughs> so at the end of the night, well, sorry, that, that's actually a lie. If we stayed, there was two shifts. You would everybody would arrive before the show, you would seat the patrons mm -hmm. and that shift would then leave as soon as the show started out of that shift. Uh, two people per floor would stay for the whole night mm -hmm. and they would get an extra $4. So you're either making $7 or $11 a night. So yeah, like, like forget about minimum wage, <laughs> 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 but like, I think most of us would have done it for free. Oh yeah. We were just, you know, you have to also put it in context. That was like, you know, early 80s. Massey Hall was one of very few concert venues in town. So almost everybody that was anybody was coming through there to play. So it was just like, you know, we'd get two, probably two good rock shows a week on top of all other kinds of other things like, you know, Symphony and, uh, you know, Nana Muscuri would do seven shows in a row. And Gordon Lightfoot had his yearly between nine or 11 shows in a row. And we saw them. And they encouraged us to stay and watch the show. There was actually a row in the balcony that the uh, ushers could stay and sit in. We not only saw all the shows, we saw all the sound checks too. Oh, wow. And at that time, that was, you know, that's one of my favorite times in, in, in music, I think, is like late 70s, early 80s is when a lot of the really good rock happened for me. Wow. Well, it's I agreed. There's so much. Like, there's, I can't even, you know, if I start to think about it, there's so many things that I saw that I can't believe that I got to see. Like, you know, mm -hmm. that as a kid at that age, you know, I would have seen some of it. There's no chance I would have even been able to afford to go to all those shows. But boy, Massey Hall allowed for a lot of, you know, I saw a lot of great music there. I mean, you're spoiled too, right? Because you're seeing it in the best place in the world. Totally. The sound checks were such a thrill you would you would get to the hall and you'd be putting your uniform on you'd hear that first sort of bass drum and you would all rush we'd all rush upstairs to see what was going on mm -hmm. i remember a couple that were remarkable was um the police were playing there on the Zenyatta Mandata tour and their oh. sound check started we all went upstairs thinking we were going to see the police during their sound check and it was their three each of their roadies did oh, the no. whole sound check the police, really? the police didn't show up for the, they didn't show up for the sound check it was just three guys that knew the song so well that everybody thought it was them. 
and then Bob Dylan on the slow train coming to her, he hired his own security crew to keep everybody out of the hall during the sound check. So well, there was a separate security that kept the ushers out of the hall. So we couldn't watch the sound check. <laughs> That's so <laughs> funny. Oh, wow. But so yeah. what were some of the sound checks that you did see that were, that were uh, memorable? That were great. Um, uh, squeeze, nice. uh, squeeze on, uh, probably the, uh, what the album would have been, boy, it was after RG Bargy, one album after RG Bargy. I'm forgetting the name mm. now, but, um, fantastic uh that was a squeeze and the show was squeeze and flock of seagulls and it was probably one of the best wow. shows i've ever seen gordon lightfoot's sound checks were always a thrill and they were always so kind of laid back and yeah just just wonderful oh you too you know there was a there was a there was a ton like just ultravox had oh. like an amazing stage setup and their sound check went on forever <laughs> it was wow, so cool yeah. wow yeah, you know, the list. I mean, honestly, we could do a whole podcast on stuff that plays out in Massey Hall. It's yeah. amazing. Well, for next time and your twenty seventh time on the show, we can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I owe you a jacket. I think, don't I? Pardon me, one more time. I said I owe you a jacket. I said that um, you know, if you do the show five times, I'm going to buy you a jacket. Oh, this is that's right. I get the jacket now, and the uh, the card and the membership to the, uh, the private club. This is great. It's a very exclusive club. Now I really can't wait for the <laughs> pandemic to end so I can hang out with the other five timers. That's right. Uh, Eddie Murphy, St- uh, Steve Martin, <laughs> Joe Piscopo, all those guys. I think you're confusing this with Saturday Night Live. But... <laughs> <laughs> all right, next tune, the band, mm-hmm. Stage Fright. Stage Fright by the band, yes. So if the last waltz is the live album that gets the most attention from the band i i would put this one ahead of it as a sort of a purely great recorded performance i mean the last waltz is fantastic don't get me wrong but mm-hmm. holy cow like you this this album which is called rock of ages um 1972 at the uh academy of music in new york and it's an incredibly long show i think um the keyboard intro that garth does to uh to chest fever is, is worth the price of the album alone. It's not unbelievable. It's just unbelievable music. You know, it's kind of a the showing this is the band at the height of their plan together. Like it just, there's just nothing like what they could do. The five of those guys together, you can hear it. Yeah, this is also one of those albums where the, uh, you hear the audience, you hear the audience rise and fall with them and how there is like a palpable excitement in the room of the, what they're hearing is completely unique. You know, so I chose, I mean, it could have been any number of songs from this record, but Stage Fright, Rick Danko, one of the greatest voices of all time, as far as I'm concerned, and that, a great song. And, uh, you know, this it's I've always kicked myself because I never did see Rick Danko play, and there was opportunities because before he passed, he would often do shows at the Horseshoe, and uh, I wish I'd, uh, you know, got off my butt and gone to see one of them. But um, anyways, I do have friends that... that uh, know him and worked with him and sounds like he was an amazing guy and uh boy this version of the song on this record is out of this world Mm -hmm. this next one i love the flaming lips the golden age you in this you can just hear this you know it's a beck song but there's this beautiful stoicism in the song yeah it's like i mean so, so this for me was more of a an experience uh situation i saw the flaming lips once on the tour with back, so they they did a, a joint tour where the Flaming Lips would open up and then they would back up back, and that was a Massey Hall show. And then I saw them shortly after that do their own show at uh, at the Phoenix. That was an incredible night. But the the Massey Hall show, you know, and for me, all this sort of back connection to Massey Hall. So I loved being in that room. Period. The Flaming Lips came on stage that night, and about thirty seconds into the first song their electronics on stage completely died. Like oh. just everything, everything died. They ended up playing a shorter set because of it. Um, I think they did five songs, but they did the five songs completely acoustically, vocals and everything. So that to me was like a moment where you sort of stood there going, I can't believe what I'm watching right now. Yeah, This is a band that, you know, relies heavily on the electronics that go, go in behind the song, but they just kind of peeled it back and, uh, you know, did it in the most stripped back way. And it was just absolutely beautiful. And I think, you know, it's, it's also kind of daunting. I understand why they kind of cut it short because it wasn't, they probably felt it wasn't coming across as well as it was, but boy, was it ever coming across well. 
but you know the the thing about the, the flaming lips is like from the minute you arrive at the show you're part of it like wayne coin is on stage I, this, this at least then he was i'm not sure what he does now but i haven't seen him in a while but he was on stage from the minute we got to our seats like he's just out there kind of setting stuff up talking mm-hmm. to the audience you know make, getting everybody riled up and it's a it's a really unique experience for that reason and Beck being the exact opposite, very sort of like, you know, withdrawn and came out and did a more sort of straight show. They'd say that got the sound stuff worked out for him and he did a great show too. But I just thought this was a, a cool uh, song to include because, uh, you know, they went on and did their own cover of uh, Golden Age. And uh, that's from an album called Fight Test, which was like kind of a collection of uh, singles and B-sides from Yoshimi, Battles of Pink Robots. So, so yeah, pretty cool. It's awesome. I love it. Okay, I knew that you were going to have a Dylan tune on your playlist here. So this is uh, a fantastic one, Desolation Row. So there was probably probably uh, four different Dylan songs on, on the short list that I made getting ready for this. And then you know, I realized I have to boil it down to something that makes the most sense. And I can honestly say there's probably not a recording period that I've listened to more than this this version of Desolation Row, which which is from Royal Albert, Albert Hall, but it's actually the Free Trade Hall in Manchester. It's haunting. It's him and an acoustic guitar with a little bit of harmonica, and it is haunting. I, I remember I used to like take the streetcar to work, and I would just play the song over and over in my headphones on the way way in, and usually on the way home too. There's just something about there's a comfort that comes along with hearing this song like nothing I've ever heard before. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the uh, the original album version of Desolation Row, I like that as well, but it's got a little more jangly, upbeat feel to it. This version takes it into the depths of where I think this song actually lives. And, boy, it is stunning to this day. It just invokes all these, all these feelings and all these emotions. And I think it's just from crazy, repeated listening. <laughs> Well, it's a commemoration, I think, isn't it? Yeah. A, lo- a lot of these songs, especially the Barbara Streisand song, it's like 70s AM radio glory to me. Yeah. I just think of being a kid. It's like, it's emblematic. It's a commemoration of my childhood when I hear this music. I, I love it. Yeah, it's such a different different time and a different way we listen to things. Like, yeah. uh, like you said, radio was probably the main conveyor belt that we were hearing things, hearing things that we weren't buying anyways in those mm-hmm. days, so. That's just not the case now. Like you can you basically, if a song comes to mind, you can call it up in 13 seconds and play it. Like I mean, I, I'm sure you have the same experience, but I remember before I would buy records when I was a kid, I would would sit by the radio with my little uh, you know tape recorder mm-hmm. and through live air record the songs that I liked, <laughs> so I could hear them over and over again before I would buy them. And you know, so you had these crappy versions that were recorded through the radio. And they'd gotten wise to us in those days, and they would put in these like two second pauses in the songs. Oh, I didn't know on that. On occasion. Yeah. So you would try to catch one without the pauses, but as songs got more popular, they would put the pauses in more. And they didn't want you recording it off the radio. Boy, did they not know what was coming. I know. No kidding, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like. Jesus. Yeah. I used to do that, Stephen. So I used to I used to record from the radio, but I also would record from the TV. Oh, yeah. I would have my like uh, recording device up in front of the TV, and if I knew the Iron Maiden video was going to play, I would just kind of record that. Which is it's like so terrible. Oh, oh, for sure. Like when much music was playing twenty-four yeah. hour videos, you'd sort of stay up hoping to see whatever it is you wanted to see, and press record the minute it came on. But yeah, I should find some of those tapes too. The reason why I did that was because on the radio, what they would do, they would do this thing called hitting the post. And the DJ would talk right up until the vocal line came in. That's right. Right? And that would screw up your recording. <laughs> right? So I didn't like that. So I thought maybe I'll try and get, you know, a version from the TV instead. And maybe that's why they were doing that, to your point. Maybe that's why they were they were doing that, hitting the post. Oh, I think, I think you're right. And so you make a good point. So when you were recording off the radio, you also had to catch the song in the middle of a set, too. You couldn't, it couldn't be the first song they were playing. Because, yeah, they would always talk. Like, what's the term called? Hitting the post. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All the tricks to keep us from uh, stealing music. <laughs> like, like I said, <laughs> if they only knew what was coming. Scamming the scammers. <laughs> All right. So your last tune, this one kills me 
I loved the song when I was a kid. It's super sad. It kind of reminds me of um, Send in the Clowns a little bit in that way because it carries that same kind of melancholy. It's Nina Simone and Mr. Bojangles. Yeah, I, you know, I think, you again, with Nina Simone, it could have been any number of songs. But I think literally the greatest singing voice of all time. I just, you know, anything she did. And I think this is an actual live version recorded in 74 it's on an album called it is finished but i think so much of the music of hers that i know she recorded live off the floor so she often has like a dialogue going with the band during the song and it just all feels so you know just so behind the beat and perfect like the most perfect voice of all time boy yeah it's like and and yeah you're right about this this particular song mr bojangles always and again i think the first version i heard of this song was uh my dad played a lot of um, Sammy Davis Jr. when we were when we were kids, and I think it was him doing it. It was the first version I heard. So it's just one of those songs that has a natural ability to just pull your heartstrings right out of your chest. Like, yeah, totally. And his was the version that I had heard as well. But this one, I, I love the accessibility of it. It's live. You can hear her voice crack when she reaches for those higher notes. She's just she wants to share it with you, and it's like, wow, it's so accessible, and you just feel like you're there almost. Yeah, that's the way. You know, even. Even something that, you know, might be a little bit sort of off the beaten path as a vocal sort of where she takes the vocal and whatever she does with her voice is beyond perfection to me. Like, it's just, holy cow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it is something else. Like, there's just so many, and there's like, there's so many sort of uh, different styles she approached. Like, you know, I remember one of the albums that we played a lot around our place was a collection of her doing like a, she does like Dylan songs and Randy Newman songs. And mm. they're just like, they're just the best versions of those songs. Like they just, it's just nothing she couldn't do. It was just amazing. Yeah. You know, I, I know that you're um, happy to take on this exercise of going through these songs, but like you, you, I have to tell you that you've really inspired me, re-inspired me to go back and listen to all the worlds a stage and Mr. Bojangles yeah. and, because there's so much more to hear in there. You know, when I was a kid, I used to hate live recordings because I was like, ah, it just doesn't sound good. But as I got older and wiser, I thought like there's so much interesting stuff in there that you're missing unless you really listen closely. Yeah, well, there was also there was also this propensity, and especially in the '80s, that, and, you know, and there's documented stories about bands that would. And I'm not going to name names, but we do know we do know a lot of these stories where where bands would release a live record, but they'd actually gone into the studio and re-recorded a lot of the parts. I really think in the, all these cases that I've chosen, I think these are actual like this was real live music recorded as it was played and released as a live record. And you're right, going back to it, like, you know, like this is, year, some of these is so many years later, you hear it in a different way now, for oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. You, and I think also at the moment in history we are, we're at right now, you're also hearing it in the context of, boy, like, wouldn't it be good to hear some live music? Like, and I think that adds an element to it as well. It's just something that we maybe took for granted is just not there right now. So boy, it's a, it makes a big difference. You're right. I'm, I'm going to head down to the basement after this is done and uh, and spin some of these for sure. Yeah. It was a fun exercise all week. Like I've been playing all these records again and listening to them. And I got to say, like as, a, as an album, like uh, Rock of Ages by the band, boy, it doesn't get a lot of hype because they are known for one of the greatest live experiences of all time with The Last Waltz. But mm-hmm. holy cow, like that's, you know, you, you hear the years of those guys in the basement at, at the big pink playing together in that performance. It's just unbelievable. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate oh, it. Oh, thanks. This, this has been a blast. Yeah. And happy birthday. Happy. I wished you happy birthday yesterday, but happy belated. Well, yesterday, birthday. but. Yeah, I just, I table to my family that maybe a birthday shouldn't just be one day and should actually last for a few days. So, so I think we can, we can carry on with that, I think. Well, you know what I do. I do the full week. I stretch it out and get the, the, <laughs> the full ticket. And I, it's true. Why wouldn't you? It's once a year, you know? Of course. Hey, and honestly, what else have I got to do right now? Exactly. <laughs> what I want you to do now on your birthday, and we talked about this previously, is I want you to do the birthday tour like I do. I want you to go to all of your favorite dining establishments, get one thing off the menu and eat them all together. <laughs> little, I, I love that idea. It, it just be harder to do right now. All the mask wearing and social distancing, but 
But yeah, that's a, that's a, uh, I, I know you did that for your last birthday and that's a, uh, that's a fantastic idea. Just, uh, getting it, getting the best of everything. As a birthday gift, I may even be willing to, to perform this for you in obtaining your, your favorites and dropping them off at your house. <laughs> well, it's something, it's something we have to look at for 2021 for sure. That's right. I'm putting it on my calendar as soon as we get off this call. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the new live record is out now. By the time this airs, it is Live Static Roots, recorded in Oberhausen, Germany. Check that out, folks. Stephen Stanley, thank you so much. You're a, a good man and a close friend. I appreciate your time today, sir. Thanks, Brent. This has been a blast. I, I, you know, I think this is uh, putting this list together of live music, just like it, like like you just said, opened up a little portal to the past for me that I'll be uh, living in for a while to come, I think. Mm-hmm. Very nice. Me too. And uh, I look forward to seeing you live again. Yes, I can't wait till that day comes. Well, our first order of business is to make another record because we're ready to go. As soon as as we can safely get into a studio to do it, we'll be there doing that. And I will say that you've got an excellent assortment of songs ready to go. I've heard most of them, and I'm super excited about that record coming out. Yeah, me too. And there's some new stuff that's been happening during a pandemic writing spree, so there's going to be a lot of uh, material to choose from, and I think it's going to be a fun album to make for sure. Definitely. All right, my friend, thank you so much. And enjoy the rest of your birth week. Thank you. (laughs) All right. Good talking to you, Brent. Good talking to you, buddy. All right. Take care. Take care. This has been No Sleep Till Sudbury with Brent Jensen and my pal Stephen Stanley. Till next time, take good care. Brent Jensen is the best selling author of No Sleep Till Sudbury, Leftover People, and All My Favorite People Are Broken. All titles available in stores and on Amazon Worldwide.